So, ich habe eine Frage an dich. Glaubst du, dass Jesus Gott ist? Okay, du glaubst, dass Jesus Gott ist. Du weißt es nicht sehr gut. Ich habe eine Frage an dich. Ist Gott allwissend? Gott ist allwissend. Also Jesus ist allwissend. Okay. Lügt Gott? Also Jesus lügt nicht. Okay. Johannes 13, Vers 32. Entschuldigung, Markus. Markus 13, Vers 32. Jesus wird gefragt, wann ist der jüngste Tag? Er sagt, das weiß nicht ich. Das wissen nicht die Hänge im Himmel, das weiß nur Gott. Hat er hier gelogen oder weiß er es nicht? Er weiß es nicht. Er ist auch nicht gestorben, was eben gesagt Gott weiß alles. Er hat gesagt, Gott weiß alles. Er hat gesagt, Jesus weiß es nicht.
Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum. That is the greeting of peace. Peace be unto you. You come back here every week and you get to learn something, God willing. And we're thankful and grateful to the creator of the heavens and earth who's given us this platform where we can share some of these truths with you. And something that is on the minds of a lot of the people is Jesus God. Is he the son of God? Is he divine? Now, for me to just tell you this is one thing, but for somebody who has graduated and mastered this topic, who has the masters in divinity from none other than the prestigious Harvard University, 
He finished seminary school. He was an ordained minister. Our good friend, Dr. Gerald Dirks, when we come back, he's going to help us tackle this topic. We'll be right back. Sit tight. Salaam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah. Praise be to God. All right. That's good. We're, we're excited you're back with us to tackle this topic, Is Jesus God? But before we go into that, they heard me mention some of your credentials. Can you just briefly talk about a little bit about your history, where you studied, and what you uh, uh, specialized in in school? I had a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy. I was basically pre-theology from Harvard College, a Master of Divinity from Harvard uh, Divinity School. I was ordained into the diaconate in the United Methodist Church and uh, subsequently went on and received uh, a master's and a doctorate in clinical psychology. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you know this topic. You're qualified to talk about it. That's why we brought you here for you to help us clear up this misconception. Many people, they are being taught that Jesus is God. Now, can you tell us what is the evidence, where does this belief come from, stem from, and is this true? Well, first of all, you know, to say Jesus is God and leave it strictly at that, with adding nothing else, is actually for traditional Christianity a heresy. Mm -hmm. that, that is a heretical statement to make. Mm -hmm. It is a non-Christian statement to make, mm -hmm. according to traditional Christianity. Traditional Christianity, or we look at early Christianity, there, there were three basic positions that were taken with regard to the nature of Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, some early Christians said, Jesus is God, pure and simple. Mm -hmm. Now, like I said, that was heresy. The Docetus, for example, took that position. Um, the second position is Jesus was God and man simultaneously. Now, this is the traditional orthodox position of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Um, as stated at the Council of Chalcedon, uh, there were two natures in Jesus, um, one divine, one human, and these two uh, natures were both present, but they were neither mixed nor separated. Now, if something's not mixed and it's not separated, I don't know what's left, but the traditional creed coming out of Chalcedon was two natures, human and divine not mixed, not separated. Third position in early Christianity was that Jesus was human, albeit a man who stood in a special relationship with God. There was evidence supporting that there was uh, groups that believed that he was not God, he was purely human. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. And these were some of the earlier Christian sects? Yeah, basically in, in terms of... Uh, history of Christianity. There's a broad group of uh, early Christians that were known as subordinationists. And by that, it's meant that they subordinated Jesus to God. Didn't put them on the same level. Mm -hmm. And of special interest would be one particular group of subordinationists that were called adoptionists. And they were called adoptionists because when it came to this concept of the Son of God, mm -hmm. their response was to say, well, like an adopted son, not like a physical son mm -hmm. or a literal son. Yeah. So they understood this concept of Son of God in a very metaphorical way. And in fact, uh, if we look at, at the context, and I think we need to look at historical context when we talk about this concept of Son of God, If we look at uh, the Bible, we see that Israel as a whole, the whole of Israel, and especially the sub-tribe of Ephraim, were referred to as the sons of God. And you can find this at home. I'll read them slowly. Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, Hosea 11, verses 1 through 3, and 10 through 11, and Jeremiah 31, verses 9 and 20. Talk about the Israelites as a whole and the tribe of Ephraim as being the sons of God. The Bible also tells us that certain Israelite kings 
were called the sons of God. So, for example, David referred to as the son of God in Psalms 2, verse 7. Uh, Solomon also referred to as the son of God uh, in 2 Samuel 7, verses 13 through 14. Angels referred to as the sons of God in Job chapter 1, verse 6. Any faithful person of Israel being referred to as the son of God in Deuteronomy 14, verse 1. And finally, any righteous man. And uh, let, me, let me quote this one. It's Ecclesiasticus uh, 4, verse 10. Ecclesiasticus, or the wisdom of uh, Jesus ben Sirach. Be as a father to orphans and in a place of a husband to widows. Then God will call thee son and will be gracious to thee and deliver thee from the pit. So what we're left with here, and we need to understand this historical context. Among the Israelites in first century Palestine, mm -hmm. to be called the son of God simply meant you were a righteous and pious man. That's it. That's all it meant. Now, the Bible translators do a trick on people because when they translate Son of God in reference to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, they put a capital S in Son. Mm -hmm. Well, in the Greek, there's no capital, no lowercase. That's not that, fair. That, that's a totally arbitrary thing seems the translators like some, are doing. See some deception going so, on. Well, and then anywhere else where someone's called the Son of God, they use yeah. a lowercase s. Yeah. But that's the translators. That's not in the text. Okay, like I said earlier, we are humbly trying to express what the truth of Jesus' message really was. And we know that as ones who have consciously submitted to the will of God, i.e. Muslims, mm -hmm. that we go by the verbatim word of God, which is unedited, unchanged, preserved, memorized by millions, the verbatim word of God. And in there, it's an article of our faith to believe in the messengers, Jesus being one of them. So if we don't believe in Jesus... You cannot be a Muslim. We love Jesus. We respect him. We believe in all these miracles which you, you will, that he did. You uh, uh, elaborate on this a little bit further. But the Quran says, if you're truthful, bring your evidence. Mm -hmm. So we just want to do what our book is saying, what the Creator is saying, that bring your evidence. So if we look at the Bible, what are some of the strongest proofs that someone can use? Because there are some evidence that some people will present to justify Jesus being divine. Well, we, we can turn to one of them, uh, and, and that, of course, is the, the concept of the virgin birth, mm -hmm. as it is portrayed in, in Matthew uh, and in Luke. Uh, this is a process of divine begetting. Yeah. Uh, the problem for Christians, however, if they stop and think about it, is we, some, the Christians say we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, but if Jesus is God the Son... Who's his father? Mm. Well, Christians automatically would say God the Father. And yet what the Bible says in Matthew and Luke is that the Holy Spirit came upon Mary, mm -hmm. not God the Father. Mm. So who, who's the one doing the begetting here? Uh, that's one consideration. In Islam, in the Quran, we have the story of the virgin birth. Yeah. But for us, there's a crucial difference between the virgin birth as told in the Quran and the virgin birth is told in Matthew and Luke. And that difference is, in the Quran, it's not divine begetting. It's a miraculous creation. And again, uh, I'd like to just quote those yeah. verses from the Quran. But my Lord, she cried out, that's Mary cried out, how can I have a son when no man has touched me? And so it is that God creates what he wills, the angel replied. When he decides a matter, he only has to say, be, and it is. The example of Jesus in the sight of God is like that of Adam. He created him from dust, saying, be, and he was. That's the third chapter of the Quran, verses 47 and 59. So, a totally different twist. Mm -hmm. This is a miraculous creation, yeah. not an act of divine begetting. Now, Christians point to the virgin birth and they say divine begetting. They also tend to uh, turn to the story of the baptism of Jesus mm -hmm. as they find it in the Bible. And I'm turning now to the third chapter of Luke. 
And this is the baptismal story. Basically, it says that Jesus goes to John the Baptist, peace be upon them both. He's baptized by John the Baptist, and as he's standing there, the skies open up, and the Holy Spirit descends upon him in bodily form like a dove. And then, and a voice came from heaven, You are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And many Christians will point to this verse. Mm -hmm. However, as noted in a footnote yeah. in the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, other ancient authorities read differently. They read, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As an adult. At the time of the baptism. Mm -hmm. Well, under this understanding, if you're begotten as a 30-some-year-old man, obviously the begetting is not to be understood literally or physically, but only metaphorically at most. Yes. And in point of fact, for Christians who may doubt uh, that probable original wording of Luke, uh, they can turn to other places in the Bible and find the same wording. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5, in reference to Jesus, we have the same wording. Today I have begotten thee. We also find it in the 13th chapter of Acts, the 33rd verse. We have it in the Psalms, Psalms 2, verse 7, being applied to David. Remember, more than just Jesus was called the Son of God. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, this notion that Jesus became the Son of God in a metaphorical sense at his baptism was a cardinal tenet of many early Christian groups. For example, the Ibionites, mm -hmm. a very uh, large Christian group originally in Palestine, they were in existence during the time of the 12 disciples. They uh, fled from Palestine at the time the Romans destroyed the temple um, and spread out into Syria, Jordan, etc. And we know they continued as a viable group of Christians well into at least the third century. Yeah. And they were saying, no, no, Jesus is not God. Mm -hmm. Son of God, well, with a small s, metaphorically. Metaphor. He was a righteous man. He Pious, was a prophet, etc. But no, not in any literal physical sense. He wasn't divine. And we know the disciples, the actual disciples of Jesus, also held a similar view, yeah. that Jesus was not divine. And we know this because Rabbi Gamaliel, who was the president of the Jewish Sanhedrin, mm -hmm ruled officially that the early Jerusalem church of James and the disciples of Jesus mm -hmm. was authentically Jewish. And there would have been absolutely no way that the president of the Jewish Sanhedrin could have ruled that this early Christian church in Jerusalem that continued to worship at the temple was authentically Jewish if in any way, shape, or form they were saying that Jesus was divine. Yeah, wow, this is uh, amazing. Tell us, have you, can you expound on this verse where it says, let us make man in our image? What does this mean? Well, in Genesis, is that in Genesis? In Genesis. I, I've heard some Christians, when they want to prove the divinity of how God can be a man, they will say that, that let us make man or in our image. What does that mean? Well, you, you're going to get different opinions yeah. from, from different people. This is one of those very ambiguous things. Yeah. You know, at, at a very primitive level of understanding, one might say that uh, God looks like you and me. Yeah. Uh, but like I say, it's a very primitive, uh -huh. primitive level of understanding. At a more abstract level, when one would say each one of us as human beings is endowed with a spirit. Yeah. Uh, and, and that this is really all that is meant by in the image of God. Okay. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word became flesh. This is somewhere in John 1.1. 1, 1. First, cha first chapter of Some, John. Somebody will throw this in your face. What do you got to say? <laughs> well, first of all, the prologue of John we know is a later edition. Uh -huh. Later yeah. edition? Yeah, to the Gospel of John. Yeah, absolutely. Very much influenced by Greek philosophy. Mm -hmm. In fact, the term logos is very much a, a term coming out of Greek philosophy. 
But the fact that Jesus was pre-existent, you know, Islam believes that we were all pre-existent in a spiritual sense. That all the seed of Adam was gathered before God yeah. as, in a spiritual sense uh, and made to affirm the oneness of God. So pre-existence of God, or pre-existence of Jesus, excuse me, does not in any way imply divinity. Mm -hmm. And just to remind you, we are here with Dr. Gerald Dirks, who has a master's in divinity from the prestigious Harvard University, has finished seminary school. He's helping us tackle this topic. And you got to know, we love Jesus. He was one of the mightiest messengers of God who called people to not worship himself, but to worship God alone without any co-equal co-partners. Did Jesus ever tell us, please, did he ever, out of his lips, his mouth, his disciples, his friends, did they ever teach people or say this word Trinity? No. Is this Trinity the word anywhere in the Bible? No. Where are we coming up with this now? Oh, well, <laughs> this, this is a later formulation of Christianity. And uh, the doctrine of the Trinity uh, grew in fits and starts. It basically grew out of uh, Pauline Christianity as it emerged and developed in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, this concept of Trinity or the divinity of Jesus did not develop typically in the Christianity that was developing in North Africa and in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Here again we had this adoptionist trajectory where the people understood uh, Son of God to be metaphorical. You know, Jesus moved into a special relationship with God, as we would expect a prophet and messenger to do. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and, and so we, we have a long history of this adoptionist trend in early Christianity. Um, Theodotus the Gnostic mm -hmm. in the second century was preaching this adoptionist message. Theodotus the Tanner later in the second century. And, and his teaching developed to, to what was called Theodotianism or dynamic monarchianism, lasted well into the third century. Oregon, third century priest, also was teaching a subordinationist or adoptionist uh, Christology. Teaching the oneness of, of God, not yes, the tri yes. unity no, of God? No, no, no trinity, no trinity. That Jesus was clearly subordinate to God. Dionysus, third century bishop, bishop, mind you, at Alexandria, again teaching that uh, Jesus was the adopted Son of God, or subordinate uh, to God. Paul of Samosata, third century bishop of Antioch, also teaching this message. Uh, Saint Lucian of Antioch, third century theologian, teaching this message. Uh, so you can see this is uh, quite widespread uh, in the Middle East and uh, in uh, North Africa. And then finally Arius, 4th century priest and founder of Arianism, uh, who was in Alexandria, Egypt. And his movement lasted well into the 7th century mm -hmm. in North Africa and uh, the Middle East. In fact, many Christian uh, historians would say that Arianism, this particular form of adoptionism, was the majority element in Christianity during the 4th century. So this is quite, quite a statement. And, and it's interesting to look at what Arius actually taught. And as to uh, not misstate, I'm going to just read this. Arius taught that God is absolutely unique and incomparable, mm -hmm. is alone, self-existent, unchangeable, and infinite, and must be understood in terms of his absolute oneness. Given this all-important first premise, Arius concluded that, one, the life of Jesus as portrayed in the canonical Gospels, demonstrates that Jesus was not self-existent, that he changed and grew over time, if in no other way than in passing through the stages of birth, childhood, adolescence, and adulthood, and that he was finite, having a definite time of conception and birth. Therefore, Arius concluded, Jesus was God's created being, who was called into existence out of nothingness, who could not have shared in the absolute uniqueness, immutability, and infinity of God without compromising them, who could not have been of the same substance as God 
without compromising the oneness of God and who could have had no direct knowledge of God other than that which God chose to reveal to him. Now, as Muslims, I think we I can mean, affirm what Arius is saying. I mean, absolutely, that God is one. He's not his creation. He has no beginning. He has no end. He's not a man. He's not Jesus. <laughs> that God is one. He's not his creation, he has no beginning, he has no end, he's not a man, he's not Jesus. Yeah. This is what we're saying. Yes. This is what all the messengers taught. Yes, and this is what uh, Arius was teaching. This is what the adoptionists basically were teaching, though Arius is, is perhaps the one who elaborated this to the best possible extent. But, but it doesn't end here. Uh -huh, tell us you, Eusebius of Nicomedia, 4th century bishop of Nicomedia, also an adoptionist. Macedonius, 4th century bishop patriarch of Constantinople, arguably the number two man in all of Christendom behind only the Pope. And the Greek Orthodox would say equal to the Pope. Mm -hmm. He was an adoptionist. When you say adoptionist, what do you mean? This is someone who maintained that when we say Jesus is the Son of God, we mean like an adopted son. Like metaphorical. Not, yes. Like not, what we are saying, yes, pious, not righteous. Literal, not literal, yeah. uh, not physical. Uh -huh. Yeah, but someone who moved into a special relationship with God. All the prophets had a special Absolutely. relationship. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And the last and final messenger, the same thing. The prophet Absolutely. Muhammad, peace be upon him. So, so t tell us, this is very interesting, and I'm sure that those humble people, sincere people, are really getting enlightened mm -hmm. with all this new information that many people just, they haven't been taught. Mm -hmm. And you, having graduated from Harvard uh, with a Master's in Divinity, finished with a the seminary school this is like that graduate uh, above going into more profoundly of the history of the bible and all the other early manuscripts tell us do the early sects of christianity because the quran the verbatim word of god tells us that all the prophets were those who called to the oneness of god they submitted themselves now, you could take this concept in French and Japanese and whatever, but it's summed up with one word, Islam, mm -hmm. that they all did Islam. Were these earlier sects, did they seem like what you're telling me, that they were on Islam? Yes. Name yes, some more or less. More or less. Well, we, we can go on from Macedonius to uh, Aetius, 4th century bishop of Antioch. And I, I'm just naming prominent people, bishops, etc. Nestorius, 5th century bishop of Constantinople. Again, Patriarch of Constantinople and founder of Nestorianism, a mm -hmm. Christian movement that lasted well into the ninth century yeah. uh, in China. Theodore of Mopsuestia, who was the fifth century guardian of right faith of the Persian church. Uh, Saint Clotilda, fifth and sixth century princess of Burgundy. All adoptionists. Now, what happened was that Arius... And Arianism became so popular that it threatened to pull Christianity apart. Mm -hmm. And at this time, Constantine, who's the emperor of Rome, is sitting on a fairly shaky throne. Yeah. And to secure his place politically in 313, he issued the Edict of Milan, which legalized Christianity for the first time in the Roman Empire. Uh -huh. Well, this got him the support of the Christians, obviously. Yeah. So that helped secure his throne a bit more. But the conflict that was emerging within Christianity about what's the nature of Jesus was threatening to tear apart that, that part of his coalition. Mm -hmm. And so Constantine called for the Council of Nicaea in the year 325. And he called the bishop, said, we want you to come. Let's sort this out. Let's figure out what's the nature of Jesus. Well, first of all, a lot of bishops didn't show. Uh, I mean, they, they weren't going to travel to Nicaea, which is in modern-day Turkey, and um, submit to this sort of a council with Constantine's soldiers gathered all around them. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of people didn't go. Those who went uh, to defend Arius, um, they basically were placed under a lot of pressure, 
many of them who voted for what came to be known as, as the Nicene Solution later recanted as soon as they went back home. Uh -huh. But Constantine... You can imagine the pressure probably oh, yeah. of the guards and this atmosphere Constantine, now. as it turns out, was actually an adoptionist. Uh -huh. When he was actually later baptized later in life, he was baptized by Eusebius of Nicomedia, a, a, a Marian. So he, he was an adoptionist. But the adoptionism was centered in the Middle East and in Egypt and North Africa. Constantine's looking for allies closer to home. Yeah. And the closest one to home is the Bishop of Rome, or what later came to be known as the Pope. And the Bishop of Rome was very much in this camp of Jesus is both God and man simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And so Constantine sort of sold out his own beliefs uh, for political power and made an alliance with the Bishop of Rome. And coming out of the Council of Nicaea was this statement that Jesus and God are of the same substance. Now, this is starting to get us towards the Trinity, but Nicaea still didn't say anything about the Holy Spirit, really. So, Jesus and God are of the same substance. How unpopular was this decision? Sixteen years later, in 341 at the Council of Antioch, the assembled bishops basically said, we're not going to touch this question. And so their creedal formulation said nothing about any relationship between God and Jesus. They were begging off the question. And 16 years after that, in 357 at the Council of Sirmium, the assembled bishops actually voted a creed which said that Jesus is not of the same substance as God. Now, if you look at the decision of the Council of Sirmium in the year 357, the official position of Christianity was Jesus and God are not of the same substance. Mm -hmm. It was only if the Second uh, Ecumenical Council of Constantinople in the year 381 that the so-called Nicene Creed uh, was uh, actually issued. Uh, and, and it is at the Council of Constantinople in 381 that the Nicene Creed came out, not at uh, the Council of Nicaea in 325. So th this was a hotly debated issue. What's mm -hmm. the nature of Jesus? Uh, and as I said before, uh, a majority of Christians in the 4th century were adoptionists. Now, a person may say, okay, what happened to these adoptionists? Why, why don't we see them around today? Well, in point of fact, we do. The Jehovah Witnesses claim that they're followers of Arius, and the Unitarians, as originally formulated, also claim they're followers of Arius. But the main reason we don't see Arians today or adoptionists today is we need to look at where they were centered. They were centered in North Africa. They were centered in the Middle East. And they basically died out in the 7th century. Mm -hmm. Now, why did they die out in the 7th century? I would submit to you the reason was the message that was brought by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. These people were so closely aligned with what we have come to call Islam that in the 7th century they naturally converted in mass into Islam. We're, we're going to have to do a part two. They're signaling that we're out of time for this mm -hmm. session, and we're going to have to continue on. This is very intriguing, enlightening, and can we continue on a part two? Sure. Inshallah. Okay, we're going to take a break, and we're going to try to come back and do a part two. So next week, come back, where we continue talking about, is Jesus divine? Did he say he was divine? As you can see, the evidence is pointing toward him not being divine, that he was indeed a messenger of God. This is what his disciples, those around him, his companions believe, and all the plethora of evidence of the early Christians and what the last and final messenger, the Prophet Muhammad, came with the verbatim word of Qur'an, which clears all this doubt off about him and tells you that he was indeed one of the mightiest messengers of God. So we're going to continue on talking about this mighty messenger, Jesus, to clear up his name. So come back next week here on The Dean Show, and we'll continue talking about this with our good friend, brother, Dr. Gerald Dirksen.